Hello and welcome to the Festival of the Muses. This live stream is presented by the Center for Hellenic Studies in collaboration with the Isidore Duncan International Institute, the Ecumenical Delphic Union, and the Committee for the Reinstatement of the Delphic Games. I'm Lana Coley and I'm so excited to introduce the next panel, Epic Hymns and Invocations. You'll hear from researchers who are working to uncover the earliest evidence for ancient Greek music and you'll meet musicians who continue to set new music to ancient texts. To begin, I'm honored to welcome to our virtual stage, Bettina Joy de Guzman. Bettina is a multi-instrumentalist, educator, and classicist who composes music inspired by ancient cultures from around the world, especially ancient Greek music and poetry. She performs and lectures in various universities and museums internationally, as Regents Fellow at the University of California in Irvine, she taught ancient Greek and Roman history as well as mythology. Please welcome Bettina Joy de Guzman. Thank you, Lana. It is an honor to be here. Today I begin with Queen Penelope. In Homer's Odyssey composed around 700 BCE, Penelope must entertain the suitors who have insisted on staying at her home until she chooses one to marry. We are given glimpses of her sorrow alone in her chambers when all she wants to do is sleep to escape. Odyssey, book 18. Penelope lamenting. Sappho of Lesbos was widely regarded as one of the greatest lyric singer-songwriters during her time from around 600 BCE. In this poem, the speaker invokes Aphrodite, who assures her not to worry about her object of affection. Even if she flees, she shall soon follow, and if she loves not, shall soon love, however unwilling. Sappho, fragment one. Thank you. 
Sophocles wrote his tragedy, Antigone, around 441 BC. This comes from the chorus introducing the play, singing to the sun. Sun's first rays, light more beautiful than ever shone on seven-gated Thebes, you shine at last, eye of golden day, gilding Dirkis lapping streams. These lines Describing Thebes' natural beauty contrasts against the armored and white shielded Argive warriors in frantic retreat. Antigone, Paradas. <laughs> and Apollo sings how Leto's son goes to Rocky Pitho, playing upon his lyre, then immediately the undying gods think only of the lyre and song, and all the muses sing together. Homeric hymn to Pithy and Apollo. It's only to Rikidis wheels. For me, Giga de Rey, Prospito, Petre Stan. Amro to him at the hunt of the woman, to you the four weeks. You say he publicly to Kana, Hena, Hena, Out 
Ти катата на твой си мане, гитариста е мой ден. Мусай мен, хама пасай, ме и поминай, твой калей. И ме усим, слата юн тога мрутей, антропон. Клей му се нас, хвази хонте си пата, на твой си пейой си. The opening lines to Homer's Iliad, the epic about the Trojan War. Sing wrath, goddess, the wrath of Achilles, son of Peleus, that destructive wrath which brought countless woes upon the Achaeans and set forth to Hades many valiant souls of heroes. Sing wrath, goddess. <laughs> The main character of the Iliad is Achilles, son of the powerful sea goddess Thetis. In this rather startling excerpt from book one of Iliad, Achilles bursting into tears, drew apart from friends and sat down on the shore of the gray sea. Earnestly, he prayed to his dear mother with outstretched hands weeping and his lady mother heard him and she came out from the sea, stroked him with her hand and asked, child, why do you weep? Thetis and Achilles. <laughs> Who's the dark to the 
Odysseus's crew members heard the goddess Kirki singing. She welcomed them into her home, offering food and drink. Then she waved her wand and turned them into beasts. She reassures Odysseus, however, why Odysseus, thus do you sit mute, not touching food or drink? You need not fear, for already have I sworn a mighty oath. But who knows how she really feels? Kirki enchanting. complete lyric song with musical notations is the Song of Sikilos, inscribed third century CE. It also bore the epitaph, I am a stone icon. Sikilos placed me here, a mark of immortal remembrance throughout time. The following English translation by Armand Dangour replicates the rhythm and rhyme scheme of the Greek. While you live, shine bright. Don't let anything you be night. We don't have life for long, my friend. To all our plans, time decrease and end. 
Song of Sikilos. concludes the performance. I now turn to our panel, beginning with Armand Dangour. Armand teaches classics at Oxford University and has researched for many years into ancient Greek music. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so first, um, thank you, Lana and Bettina. Congratulations, Bettina, on your interpretations and your very accomplished singing and performance on the lyre under these challenging conditions of singing to an unseen audience. I'm starting off a discussion then with friends and colleagues who will be saying something in five minutes or less about their thoughts about an understanding of ancient Greek music from different perspectives. Some are academics and researchers, others like Nikos are creative practitioners. So my own approach as a researcher is to try to understand what the ancient documents and discussions tell us about how the music may actually have sounded. We have around 60 documents of notated music that survive from the classical period down to late antiquity. As Bettina mentioned, the only piece that she sang that derives from one of those documents was the final one, the short song of Sikilos, which was inscribed on a column, perhaps around 200 CE. All the other music was new music, Bettina's own creative reinterpretation of passages of ancient text. As you will have heard, I think the idiom of the Sikilos song is not entirely familiar to us, perhaps less so than the other pieces, given that it begins on one note, what we would call the tonic of the scale, and ends on a fourth below that, the dominant. Now, those who attempt to compose new music set to ancient texts have some possible guides. One is that we know something about how ancient Greek words were pronounced at different times. And we know it differed from classical times to Roman imperial times, when it began to sound a bit more like modern Greek. Another factor to take into account is that we have a detailed understanding of the rhythms used in Greek poetry. And again, congratulations to Bettina, who has bugged me for some time to try and explain how some of these rhythms actually work. You could have heard the dactyls in, in for example, her performance of the Homer. A third is that ancient theorists tell us very precisely about the melodic and harmonic nature of the music, and it's very different from modern style. Um, and a, a fourth um, is that uh, we can now replicate ancient instruments, in particular the wind instrument, the double pipes or our loss, with some precision, and hear how they may have sounded, work out how they would have been played. Of course, it's entirely the choice of a modern creative practitioner a musician, how far to be guided by such constraints. It's quite likely that if we were to be being back to ancient Greece at any period, the music would sound quite strange to our ears and not as appealing as Bettina's songs, which use modern sounding tunings and harmonies and gentle singing style. The microtones used in the earliest music might even make us suppose that people sang and played out of tune. But if you think of listening to say Arabic or Balinese song, you'll immediately realize that a different musical idiom operates. And if you listen to sung folk traditions even today in Serbia or Albania, for example, you will know that the vocal style can sound very different from that of Western singing and that the emotion is generated in quite different ways from those that we're used to. So one of the aspects that I haven't mentioned, which is much harder to grasp, is that there was dance that accompanied so many ancient Greek performances. I believe that the next speaker will say something about this. So I'm delighted to pass on now and to introduce my friend, Dr. Maria Xanthou, who is Visiting Fellow 2020 at the Seeger Center of Hellenic Studies and a Research Associate in Pindaric Studies at Harvard CHS. So Maria, your turn. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Arman. Uh, thank you, everyone. 
participating in this event. And I would also like to thank Bettina for organizing this and uh, the CHS for uh, uh, offering uh, his uh, auspices and uh, uh, for organizing, for making this possible. Uh, today I'll be, uh, I'll be offering my five minutes to what has been uh, called um, the Kip Dillon uh, Sun, uh, Pinder Second Dithramp Orality and uh, Choral Performance. Um, first of all, I would like to start with a question about what connects Ulipo with Pindar and ancient literary theory of the composition of an ode, especially a dithyramb. Uh, I will uh, attempt to answer the question about Olipo and offer you some background knowledge that Olipo is an abbreviation for Ouvroir de Littérature Potentielle, which may be translated as a workshop of potential literature as a group of French speaking authors and mathematicians experimenting in constrained uh, writing techniques. The group was founded in 1960 by Raymond Quineux and François de Lyonnais. Novelists like Georges Perec and Italo Calvino, poets like Oscar Pasteur and Jean Lescure and uh, Jacques Rubot were included among its notable uh, members. But what were these constraints? One technique was what uh, was called lipogram. Uh, which is a writing that, it, that it excludes one or more letters. Another technique was univocalism, a poem using only one vowel letter. The other technique was S plus seven, sometimes called noun N plus seven, which means that the replacement of every noun in a text with the seventh noun after it in a dictionary or in a lexicon. Another technique were the palindromes, like words or phrases or whole sentences, which may be read the same backward and forward. Like, for example, the famous phrase that uh, we read uh, when we go to Agia Sophia, like Nipson anomemata uh, mi, monon, uh, mi monon obsten. Now I would like to focus on the first three verses of Pina Second uh, uh, Theorem, which were cited by three ancient authors like Athenaeus, Heraclitus Ponticus, and Clercus from Soli. So I would like us to, um, uh, to read what has been, uh, uh, what um, Athenaeus writes about uh, the, the, the Second Theorem. And here you, I offer you the translation. Regarding the poem composed without the letter sigma, the same clercus of Soli said that Pindar wrote the following, a kind of riddle put in lyric poetry since many had criticized him for not avoiding the use of the letter sigma and they disapproved of it. In the past, one should take note of this in response to those who rejected the asigmatic ode of Lassus of Hermione entitled Centaurs. Also, the hymn to Demeter of Hermione written by Lassus contains no sigma. And then uh, he offers the three first lines of Pindar's second uh, dithyram. Uh, I will read the Greek text, Prin men herpes hinotenia tai doia Dithyrambon, Kai to Sam, Kip Delon, Anthropos in Apostomaton. In the past, the song of Dithyrambs came forth, stretched like a measuring line, and the sun came falsely from the mouths of men, but new have been thrown open, etc., etc. Now, these verses offer us one of the most important pieces of information regarding the formation of Dithyramb as a literary genre through the phrase to Sam, Kip Delon which attracted ancient and modern classical scholars' attention. I won't go into details about how August Burke and Ludolf Thyssen attempted to decipher the meaning of the term sun in comparison to the term sigma. At this point, I would like to remind us of W.B. Stanford's observation that the Greek attitude, and I quote, to literature was more like our attitude to music than our attitude to the printed page. According to Athena, the peripatetic philosopher Aristoxenus of Tarentum, 
who also had the nickname Musicos, suggested that some archaic anonymous composers of music rejected the sigma sound uh, as it was difficult to pronounce or inappropriate for the musical instrument of aulos. Moving on to modern classical scholarship, Michalis Kopidakis, a former academic instructor of mine at my alma mater, Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, in his 1991 article, The Keep the Long Sun in the Gospel of Lucas, 22, 31 to 32, tried to pinpoint parallels between the use of S sound in the Gospel of Lucas and the books in the Old Testament, referring also to the use of modern poets, literary critics like Robert Graves, George Seferis, and Joseph Van Hebel. The next stop to this fascinating trip, à la recherche de S perdu, is the article by Armand Dangour, How the Dithram got, got Its Shape. Dangur attributes the ancient poets and literary critics' preoccupation towards the limitation or reduction of the impact of the sibilant sound to the trained and discriminating oral sensitivity, which was likely to follow from the essentially oral nature of Greek culture at this period. And I hope Milman Perry and Albert Lord, the Dioscuroi of Homeric orality, to nod from where they are. Dangur interprets Lasso's Hermionesis' purpose of asigmatic composition as an attempt to harness the uncoordinated enunciation of the S sound. Harnessing or manipulating sibilance was included in musicians' agenda like Sakadas and Auletes from Argos, who was three times successful at the Pithian festival since its instigation in 586 BCE. However, Dangur rightly insists that Lasso's preoccupation with how to manipulate siblings probably arose from his concern to evoke Ophidian and thus Apollonian associations as a consequence of adequate and sophisticated choral direction. I will not discuss Salvatore Lavecchia's and Jane Portis's views on the same passage due to, to time restrictions. As a conclusion, I would like to prompt you to think how music and logos are entangled in the composition of ancient Greek poetry and music. Moreover, I would like us to think of a view suggested by Greg Nash in his monograph, Pinder's Homer, the lyric possession of an epic past, how much the staging of co musical contests at the major Panhellenic festivals affected not only the poetic composition and production, but created and informed an increased awareness, both from the part of the audience and the poet, which resulted to a highly sophisticated attention to the composition of instrumental and choral music. The staging of a musical event, like an Epinetian song or a dithyram, required the enhanced attention to music, pronunciation, and bodily movement. All these acoustic experiments, the choral and metrical innovations, and the linguistic manipulations brought together and grounded to the Greek folk music gradually evolved into the literary genres that Pindar had composed and resulted in what has been called the omnivorous literary genre alliance known as the Attic Tragedy. And now I would like to introduce you, Professor Angelo Mariani. Uh, Professor Angelo Mariani is Associate Professor of Greek Literature at the University of Salerno in Italy, where he also gives courses on ancient Greek music. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Bettina, for invitation and Lana for organization. Let me let me share my screen. Um, among the perceptual experiences that human beings are capable of, that of sound and music is probably the most difficult to express in words, notwithstanding a great many of people in ancient Greece must have been talking about music very often and at different levels. In fact, as, as the experience of musique in its diverse manifestations was ubiquitous in everyday life of the individuals, even those not particularly cultivated, we can imagine that it was also a topic of conversation. Moreover, as musical practice was one of the most important disciplines of the paideia, the knowledge of some of its technical aspects had to be fairly common, at least among the social and cultural elites. Therefore, 
for the music as for any other practical disciplines techne, an appropriate and functional language must have been used from the beginning, which allowed experts and professionals to understand to each other, teachers to pass their knowledge on, and students to learn the principles and techniques of instrumental and or vocal practice. In a passage of the Plato's Protagoras, Socrates says that one of the most important abilities of a music teacher, guitaristes, should be that of making people highly skillful, deinos, at talking, legging, about what he is an expert in, epistemo, i.e. the art of playing kithara, guitaristes. In this view, it is worth considering the numerous scenes of musical paideia pictured on pottery with teachers and students in action. Through these, though these images should not be taken as photographs, the special care in depicting some details of the instrumental and vocal practice seem to indicate that even the painters must have known well the objects and situations they represented. On a famous red figure, Kilix, Duri's portrait a guitaristess, who during a lesson has just stopped strumming, strumming uh, 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 on, in, on his instrument, as we can easily infer from the position of the plectrum in uh, his right hand, and is talking to his student sitting uh, sitting in front of him. In all likelihood, he's giving advice on the sonorous effect produced by the particular way of striking a string, keeping it at the same time in a sort of pinch between the thumb and the forefinger in the left hand, while the boy is trying to reproduce the gesture on his own instrument specific term must have assisted for this procedure. Pottery gives us a rich visual evidence of other technical gesture for tuning string instruments, for example, for plucking the strings, for damping strings after strumming and so on. And we can reliably assume that special terms existed to designate each of them. In addition, during the 5th and 4th century BCE in Athens, a number of professional musicians named Korodidaskaloi were assigned to prepare and conduct the musical performances within the dramatic festivals. Even though the chorus members were not professionals and the songs that they were due to learn normally by imitation must have been not very complicated, the coro didascaloi must have used a sort of special, if not strictly technical language in order to communicate with them. The other practitioners active in multifaceted musical life of the polis, rhapsode, lyric poets, playwrights, singers and instrumentalists active during the symposia, must have received a more or less formal musical education in professional training but also judges of the theatrical performances, the dikastai, must have gained a musical contents of some sort during their educational curriculum and at a certain extent, a domain of the relevant technical language. Although this kind of ability was probably not the criterion that determined the choice of them in the role. Furthermore, it is well known that musicae was also a matter of culture debate, so that we can reasonably conclude that its vocabulary, to some extent, belonged to the everyday language, at least among the social and cultural elites. In this field, the boundaries between ordinary and technical vocabularies were less clear cut than we would be led to believe. Before the origin and development of the scientific prose, Greek poetry gives numerous descriptions of the multimedia and interactive experience of music in poetry, focused quite, 
quite exclusively on the wide and profound sensory and emotional involvement of the people attending the performances. In general, nouns, verbs, and adjectives of wide semantic power were employed to describe the multiplicity of auditory, visual, and even tactile stimuli that musique induced uh, into the listeners. In, it, is, it was from this rich lexical material that a specifically musical vocabulary developed. It is the most effective tool to elaborate a music theory proper. It, it is no coincidence that the first author of a treatise dedicated to music, also in its theoretical aspects, was a poet and a musician, Lassus of Hermione. Unfortunately, of his text, we know only the title and very few fragments of problematic interpretation. We also know that within the school of Aristotle, a great interest developed for speculation on music and that his pupil and successor Theophrastus of Eresus, Eresus was the, the same ta town of Sappho, wrote several works on music, dealing with it from different points of view. Unfortunately, even of these texts, we are left with a handful of fragments, although extremely interesting. But it is by another student of Aristotle, Aristoxenus of Tarentum, that tradition has given us a much considerable text on one of the most important branches of ancient music theory, the harmonique, which concerned the structure and analysis of scales and the rules according to which melodies were to be composed. Before becoming a pupil of Aristotle, Aristoxenus had learned the principles of Pythagorean philosophy and his approach to the discipline seeks to combine the two uh, the two tendencies. Other theoretical writings arrived in the West thanks to a famous manuscript now preserved in Venice, which also hands down some of the most known melodies of ancient Greece. A special, a special place among these writings is the De Musica, attributed to Plutarch, a text that between the 15th and 16th centuries aroused a great interest, mainly in Italy, among music, humanists and musicians who were looking for new musical languages. The text was widely circulated thanks to its translation into Latin by the Brescian humanist Carlo Valgulio in 1507. Here I uh, reproduce some pictures of the uh, first printed edition of this, of this uh, translation. He also wrote an introduction, this one, uh, to the work based on his reading of other Greek authors on music, especially Porphyry of T, who wrote an important commentary on, on the harmonica of Claudius Ptolemy. Both the translation and the proemium, the, the proemium is this and the translation is that, um, were studied in depth by Vincenzo Galilei who in turn translated them into Italian. These are the paper preserved in Firenze, Biblioteca Nazionale. And this is pre presumably his hand, um, who in turn translated into Italian and circulated their contents within the Florentine Camerata. In his famous Dialogo della Musica Antica et della Moderna, published in Florence in 1581, he was the first to publish some of the pieces handed to us from a distant past. This is the, the Italian quotation of, uh, of uh, Un gentiluomo nostro fiorentino, one gentleman of Florence, who at that time was working in Rome 
and Vincenzo Galilei asked him to find uh, as many texts, as many Greek texts about music as he, he can, and to send him by letters, copies, and so on. It is only a small example of how ancient music has sounded to the modern, and as we hope it will continue to do in the future. Thank you. And it is a pleasure now to, to, to pass uh, the turn to Andromachi Karanika, who is Associate Professor and Chair of Classics at University of California at Irvine and works on gender and poetics. Please, Maki. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, I have a bride who is wearing her mask, as you see here. <laughs> Now, the crying out of Hymenaeus becomes uh, the type of invocation that blends the address to the divine and the hymn for it, uh, as the name is duplicitous for a divine figure and the ubiquitous genre of performance in his honor. In classical times, we have a wealth of information about uh, the wedding ritual, primarily as it is depicted in vase iconography. All stages of what would typically be a three-day event were depicted in different scenes. The figure of the bride is central in many of these, often even showing different aspects of preparation and thus different temporal tableaus that followed one after the other, uh, possibly repeating itself with the central figure there. In those wedding scenes, vases are often depicted as a token of transactions or objects of ritual. But in the wedding scenes in particular though, objects interact with the human figures in intricate ways. They seem to go, uh, they seem to be beyond simple containers, but act as a steering part of the ritual and a locus for the viewer's attention who watches the vase painting. In what I consider functioning in similar ways, in what I consider functioning in very similar ways, ancient literature uses and reflects the wedding song tradition in different ways. That there was a humanio song labeled as such that we know already from different archaic sources. Now, since much of the research in ancient music and oral traditions come from a kind of a methodology that looks at both literary and archaeological record, I would like us very briefly to see this emphasis on what I call the meta level, namely how different aspects of certain performances, including the role that objects like vases played, and the performance of songs with their labels, are not simply repeated all the time, but they become a point of reference. The invocation Himen or Himenaya, maybe we can go to the next slide, uh, appear on stage, both tragic and comic. Cassandra in Euripides' Trojan Women invokes Himenaeus in a twisted wedding song. The end of Aristophanes' piece also brings the same invocation and a remnant of what would have actually been sung at weddings. That's the next slide. The tragic case, a solo performance coming from the actor playing the doomed heroine, whereas the second ends Trageus' quest for peace on a happy note with a collective song and dance. That this was a very popular genre, I think, is beyond any doubt. This distinctive use in different genres hinges on how it is presented as solo or a choir, the first twisted, the second bride and Mary. Just like the Lutroforos, the wedding vase par excellence, a type of vase which can be used for a funerary context or a wedding context. The song and the invocation to Himenaeus lends itself for shifting contexts in ways that ancient poets knew too well to play with. Poetic genres had their own hidden rules as we try to reconstruct them. Now, in an important Lutroforos Hydria, one of the early black figured phases from the uh, uh, sixth century, which depicts a Lutrophoria. Unfortunately, it's not the one I'm showing right now. But if we can go back to the previous slide again, we have the word Himenaios inscribed 
as a testament that this is a vase and a vessel time found in the sanctuary of the Nymphe, uh, which uh, was very close to the Acropolis slope. So if uh, we can have a quick look at what, as Maria said very nicely earlier, there is no sigma in here. We have the human menaye eu yumeaye. So uh, again, this is an inscription on an early vase. So in the same way one addresses in other types of popular performances, say, for example, the lullabies, where you invoke the sleep, hypnos, uh, and say, oh, hypnos, come and get the child. Humanaios also needs to be understood in, as emerging from a kind of context which can function in weirdly similar terms. It is an underscoring of the situation at hand, namely the wedding context in which the wedding divinity, so to speak, is invoked like the charming lumber invoked for a child. Unlike a lullaby, though, this is supposed to be a very vibrant song with a refrain, possibly a known, registered and circulating in ancient audiences. And thus we see its many different sort of transmutations here. Um, we know that it is vibrant. We know that the reference to the human Ius in Iliad 18, uh, we have the verb polusim anaios aurore, it had a reason, which also shows how it increases in sound, volume, and numbers of people participating in it. I will stop here and I hope we'll have uh, food for more thought. And uh, then we'll move to the inimitable Nikos Xanthoulis, a composer, research associate with the Academy of Athens, and an amazing ancient Greek liar soloist. Nick. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to Harvard University and to Bettina for having invited me to this marvelous panel. My relationship with Bettina began with a professional collaboration. She undertook the hard task of editing the English texts of my ancient Greek liar method. Her deep knowledge of the ancient Greek language combined with an extraordinary musicality was crucial for the method. We continued our collaboration playing together in concerts and recordings. A CD will be soon released featuring Bettina's marvelous interpretations of my Antigone's choruses with me accompanying here on the lyre. Now it's time to clarify that I am a musician and not a philologist. I served as principal trumpet player at the Greek National Opera for 25 years. However, having a satisfactory knowledge of the ancient Greek language, I approached the ancient Greek music both practically and theoretically. In the beginning, I played the ancient Greek salpings composed a concerto for salpings and string orchestra and presented it in 2012 in Salerno, thanks to my dear friend, Angelo Meriani. After that, I decided to work on the lyre, having in mind that this was the national underquote, instrument of the Greek antiquity. I studied thousands of lyre depictions from the pottery and other representations of the lyre from reliefs and sculptures noting a hundred percent consistency. With the word consistency, I mean repetitive representations of stances, postures of hands and fingers. I tried to build a firm technique through an everyday practice routine, having walked the analogous path with my trumpet. The magic of the lyre was being unveiled although many times I felt like reaching a dead end of no way to beyond. But the instruments have no end, whereas the musicians do have. I composed a lot of incidental music for tragedies. I felt many times the eerie atmosphere of the ancient theaters. Please let me describe you just one moment of my work. August 
16 of 2004, and the theater of Ep Epidaurus is full with 12,000 people. Absolute darkness. And I am alone in the center of the orchestra with a tympanon. I see over the edge of the theater, the moon rising, and I am happy. My music on Eumenides will be played in this temple of the humanity. I continue to work on the lyre many hours per day. I have the dream to bring the technique of the seven string lyre on the same level as any other Western instrument, trying to speak with my instrument to every man using the world language of music. I continue also to compose music for Horika of the ancient Greek drama, discovering every time new marvelous things. Could you imagine the challenge of a composer to attribute the style of each Horikon through the moral of a different mode? A manic chorus for Dionysus with composite Greek rhythms and Phrygian harmony a solemn dactylic pace of a hymn to Zeus on Dorian harmony, or a soothing song to Apollo in Aeolian harmony. In Greece, we have two extremely important luthiers that make ancient Greek instruments, one in Athens and one in Thessaloniki. I'm lucky enough to use instruments from both of them. Given the fact that Luthieros, Siklos, Thodoris Kumardzis from Thessaloniki will present their work in a few minutes, I lend my presentation with a small piece on my seven string lyre built by the great Luthier Nicolas Brass. what I played. Just to show the possibilities of the lyre and that there is no limit on the instruments. So when Sylvain will speak about the Delphic hymns, I can say that now on the seven string lyre, I can play all the chromatic tones and it is possible. I now turn to Sylvain. Sylvain is a junior researcher at the CNRS in Strasbourg, France, and he devotes his research to ancient Greek music and soundscapes, especially in Delphi, and to their reception in modern times. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, dear Nikos, for the introduction and, of course, for the wonderful performance. And uh, thank you, my, my warmest thanks to Bettina and Lana for organizing everything. So for this panel of the Delphic Festival Preview, I would like to talk briefly about the discovery of uh, the first Delphic hymn to Apollo. Just a moment to share the screen. So uh, the first Delphic hymn to Apollo, a pan, was engraved with, it, with its musical notation on marble slabs. The so-called Great Excavation of Delphi started in 1892. In the first semester of 1893, French archaeologists began to excavate the area, which was later identified as the Athenian treasury, as we can see on old photographs, which illustrate different stages of the ongoing works. So at the very beginning, and then uh, you can see the, the treasury. The first fragments of the musical inscription were found on the 5th of June, 1893, as recorded by the excavation diary. The blocks actually belong to the south wall of the Athenian treasury, which was reconstructed in 1905. The hymns were cut off and are now on display in the Museum of Delphi. As recorded by a series of inscriptions, Athenian Dionysiac artists, that's the name of the corporation, organized between 138 and 96 BC four big processions to Delphi, called Pythais, which was made of many officials and musicians, singers as well as instrument players, Kithara and Aulos. It was the occasion for Athens to manifest its power and its glory in pride, pomp, and circumstance. There is discussion among scholars to decide whether the first hymn was performed in 138 BC or 128 BC. I personally agree with the hypothesis of 128 BC with arguments I have no time to expose here. An inscription gives the name of all the participants to the Pythais of 128 BC, officials, a chorus of 40 singers to perform the paean, and other artists to compete in musical and theatrical performances. It is very plausible that the instrument players also took part to the performance of the paean. Since it is the almost only example of ritual music discovered where it had been actually performed, I would like to point out that a performance takes place in a certain space, and it is important to try to figure out where the artists performed the hymns. Recent scholarship has focused on the walkways within the boundaries of the century and has shown that the place which used to be considered as the Aula, the place where Apollo was supposed to have murdered Pitho, is actually the Agora of Delphi here. The Aula should be located in the west of the sanctuary. According to that, we can think of two main possibilities. Either the procession walks from the southwestern gate up to the great altar through the Agora, where there are two main Athenian buildings, the Athenian treasury and the, the, the Athenian store, portico. Or artists gathered along the western store to enter the sanctuary through the western gate to the terrace of the temple. This is my favorite hypothesis. Here is how it may have looked like with five officials, a dozen of musicians, and 40 singers. That's for the very first performance. Back to the future. While Henri Veil edited the text, Theodore Renac studied the musical notation and transposed it into a modern score. To advertise this discovery, Théophile Rommel, the director of the French school at Athens, decided to organize a performance of the hymn at the French school at Athens, still located on the south slope of the, of the Likavitos Hill. So the premiere of the hymn took place on March 29th, uh, 1894, in the main room of the library, as reported in different media. The audience was made of the highest authorities of the Hellenic kingdom, the King George I and the royal family. 
The French government was represented by the French diplomatic corps, the admiral, and the officers of the French Navy stationed in the Oriental Middle Sea, whose band was playing outdoors to welcome visitors. Then there were ministers, politicians, scholars, and the elite of the Athenian society, more than 200 persons in the hall, which was covered with Greek and French flags. The hymn was performed in the arrangement of Louis Nicole, who was playing piano by four Greek singers. This event was a huge success. Then the first Delphic hymn came to Paris. April 12th, Theodore Renac read a paper on, on the hymn for the members of the Etudes Grecques in the amphitheater of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and the paper was followed by the performance of the hymn by the soloist Jeanne Remacle in the arrangement of Gabriel Fauré. To conclude, I just want to mention significant performance which took place on June the 16th, 1894, at the Sorbonne University before a very different audience. It was scheduled by Pierre de Coubertin during the Congress that was about to create the modern Olympic Games. Coubertin reports that the delegates were enthusiastic after the performance. This was the starting point of an incredible diffusion of this ancient Greek melody but this is another story. Thank you for listening. And now this is my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Theodoros Kumartis from Thessaloniki. Good evening. My name is Theodoros Kumartis and I would like to welcome you at Sikilo. Sikilo is a private museum, interactive museum of music instruments here in Thessaloniki. And everything, it's actually started at a very small village named Evropos, around 50 kilometers in the north of Thessaloniki, um, where a family-based business named Luthier Music Instruments started to collaborate with Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and the Hellenic University of Greece. We have actually used any kind of references we have from antiquity, direct or indirect. We have also, with a collaboration with the university, we have found uh, references regarding the materials that were used during antiquity to make these music instruments. But also, at the same time, we try to approach the reconstruction of such an instrument in a way that a musician would like to. Uh, we have the chance to collaborate with great musicians like Ross Daly, Nikos Xanthoulis, of which you listened before, but also many other musicians uh, such as Bettina de Guzman, Rui Fu, Jerko Lorca, who had actually collaborated with us and worked with us in order to promote uh, our culture. So welcome to Sikilos. We're going to make a very small and brief tour to just take um, a little bit of what is all Sikilo about. As the majority of you might already know, uh, Apollo, the god of music, became the god of music when his brother Hermes, according to ancient Greek mythology, gave him the first music instrument. Um, as you can see, sometimes we would have text references like the Homeric theme to Hermes, where he actually literally used a third cell to make the first line that was named Hellis. As you can imagine, we have never had any kind of uh, actual animal. This is because we try to combine our knowledge with modern technology such as 3D prototyping. So what we do is we actually scan the real therapy cell in order to be able to reconstruct a music instrument that can actually achieve the kind of quality that a modern musician needs. But this is just the first step of what we did because the feedback of the musician was something really, really important for us. As you might know, there is a lot of, there's actually a huge gap regarding this particular music instrument in history. So what we're trying to do here is, on one hand, to study what is left from antiquity, and on the other hand, inspire new, more musicians to talk and to compose, to write new music for people that are actually affected by that right now. Having said that, we have actually made uh, 
chitarra, the construction chitarra of the Golden Age, that was presented by Mr. Peter Pringle, a Canadian musician, when we actually made our approach regarding the tremolo and the vibrato system of the system. Even though we do know that academically this is not proven, we have actually we used the same materials in order to be able to reconstruct an instrument that can actually help to make it. They can actually help us to make tremolo or vibrato. Having said that, I would like to uh, also uh, analyze a little bit the lyraacademy.com. It's actually the first online platform where someone can actually learn how to play the lyre, both ancient melodies but also new. And of course, the book of Nikos Xanthoulis, the first complete melody to learn how to play the ancient Greek lyre. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Bettina, and of course, the Harvard University for being here today. So I would like to, to invite Mr. Greg Nagy to continue, the professor of the Harvard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Theodore. And uh, thank you all for enlightening me in so many new ways. I've learned so much. And now my problem is how to say um, all the things that I have learned from you in five minutes. Uh, I think I'm, I might need just one or two minutes more uh, to do justice to um, the uh, amazing presentations uh, we have seen. And um, I propose that I go in reverse order so that uh, by the time I'm done in five plus minutes from now, uh, I return to um, the genial organizer of our event, uh, our dear Bettina. I'm so happy to make new friends and to reconnect with friends of long standing. And so let me start with my new friend, um, Theodoros, who uh, I think when um, he shows us these beautiful uh, re reconstructions of the ancient instruments, makes me think of how important it is, and he showed it, uh, how important it is to have the skill of a, mu of a musician in projecting sound. Um, may I uh, reminisce about a moment where I was in Athens and I was at that magnificent auditorium, the Megaro, and there was a, um, a big bouzouki, uh, um, shall we say, um, demonstration. And I couldn't believe it. The, there were three bouzouki players, and the, the two at the side were playing electric bouzouki, whereas the middle one had no, no electrical cord, whatever. And, and guess what? He overwhelmed the, the whole audience. The middleman who had no um, electric bouzouki uh, overwhelmed not only the other players, but overwhelmed the audience. And uh, uh, similarly, uh, dear Theodoros, uh, I am overwhelmed by you and by your um, wonderful project of, um, of helping us um, bring ancient music to life again. So my compliments and my admiration. And then as I turn to uh, another friend, Sylvain, um, could I just say that um, the way you presented the visuals for the um, premiere of uh, the Delphic hymns as you reconstructed it was um, so, uh, overwhelming again for me because suddenly uh, I could uh, imagine what I had been unable to imagine before and what it must have been for music to be brought to life by a choros that is simultaneously singing and dancing. Uh, and, and what a miracle it is that um, some of the reenactors already back in the 19th century included people like uh, Gustave Faure. Um, again, I am overwhelmed. 
could I also say about the hymns themselves, and um, this is a, a way for me to come to the, uh, the next speaker, um, my, my friend Nikos. Um, it amazes me how um, uh, what modernity sometimes calls musical accompaniment is really so central to the, um, the core of performance that it is really misleading to say that the human voice and for that matter, the motion of the human body uh, somehow has to take precedence over what again in modernity is sometimes called accompaniment. Um, I, I've, I've worried about this enough to convince myself that musical accompaniment shouldn't even be called accompaniment because there is such a level playing field of the organic um, structuring of the human voice, the human body and musical instruments. And um, could I say, dear Nikomu, that the way um, you brought the instrument to life just by playing a few strains uh, made me think, wow, a musical instrument is as capable of mimesis as um, Anglo classicists pronounce it or mimesis as our Greek friends pronounce it, uh, reenactment, mimesis. I don't just mean imitation, I mean reenactment of a living moment. And how, if I understood you correctly, you were saying that if you play it right, uh, the musical instrument can reenact anything, which is what I was ready to say up to this point, uh, a chorus could do. By chorus, a choros, I mean a singing and dancing ensemble, um, which for me is more capable of mimesis reenactment even than a soloist. But now I must say, uh, I have to factor in, having heard you, uh, the instrumentalist, bringing the song to life. And now I turn to a friend of long standing, my dear friend, uh, Andro Mahi, uh, with whom I've had uh, over the years so many uh, uh, stimulating conversations. And whenever Andro Mahi speaks, I learn something new. And, uh, the same goes for today. I must say the, the hymeneal performance, uh, the way you presented it uh, for us today, dear Mashi, uh, just convinces me, if you don't mind my putting my hat on as a linguist, that there must be a relationship between uh, the word humane, the word humnos, and for that matter, the word to fino, ifano, to weave. And um, if you will allow me, um, um, I'm inspired by the few minutes that you had with us to return to Odyssey 8, to Rhapsody 8 of the Odyssey, which is the only time in the Odyssey that the word humnos is actually attested. Uh, and it has to do with um, the continuity of a stylized festival. And as far as I can see, the hymnos is the continuity. It's uh, usually thought, if we read only the Homeric hymns, that um, the hymn is the beginning of something. Well, yes, it's the beginning of something, but if you make that beginning perfect, that means that the beginning becomes the middle and becomes the ending as well. May I use a, a very uh, uh, trivial metaphor here, but I can't help myself. It, it's when an airplane takes off. If you have a perfect takeoff, then you have a perfect flight and you have a perfect landing. And that's what you showed us. And for me, uh, a, a um, Hymeneal is the perfect beginning of a relationship. Um, and I can't, I can't resist um, that wonderful wish that speakers of Greek um, will say to uh, a newly married couple, which is kala stephana, beautiful garlands, by which I think is meant 
if, if you start the weaving of a garland right, it'll be a beautiful life for keeps forever. In a cyclical way, um, for me, forever is always cir circular, not linear, of course. Which brings me now to Angelo. Angelo, how much I admire you. I, um, I must say, um, the way you, you talk about not just um, the performance of music, but the organization of music and how um, uh, through all of your adventures, so to speak, with the musical world, um, you went from um, wind instrument to string instrument and back and to me, the way you talked about the trumpet uh, so inspired me. I, I was just the other day reading Pausanias, Pausanias, I was minding my own business. And, and uh, I find that the translations of Pausanias tend to be a little too literal minded. For example, um, uh, there's a tendency to think that epithets of gods and goddesses are whimsical. That's very British, maybe very Lewis Carroll. But in one translation of Papsanias, when Papsanias Pausanias is visiting the city state of Argos, he's saying, hmm, unlike, uh, unlike elsewhere, the goddess Athena, the goddess Athena has a special epithet. And then in the English translations, it just says trumpet. And wow, that doesn't, uh, 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 I hate to tell you, but um, in, in English, you can't help but think of strumpet or something. So, oh, I, I've got to block that. What, is, what does this mean that Athena is a trumpet? Well, of course, she's the embodiment of the Salpings in the life of Argive warriors, because Papsanias also tells us when the Argive warriors go to war, the musical accompaniment for their, um, their battle formation and their engagement in battle is the Salpings. Unlike, for example, the Spartans, where as most other places, the musical accompaniment for their facing death is the avlos, the, uh, the double reed. So may I say, uh, dear, dear Angelo, that in a sense, uh, you've become for me the embodiment of music. <laughs> I, I am just thrilled to hear you. Um, and now I come to another dear, dear, dear friend of long standing, Maria. Uh, um, I, I loved what you said about the euphony, so to speak, of um, avoiding uh, the, the sun, the S. And, and uh, you know what it made me think of? How, yes, when um, Greek poetics, when Greek poetics and song making wants to sound beautiful, it tries to avoid the S just as when French singers sing um, and you have the letter R as we pronounce it in, in um, English, the R grasseye in French, um, in French opera, you can't do an air grasseye. You have to trill the R. So I, I love the, um, the, the limitations, uh, the, um, the parameters of, of making sound. But then there's also the aesthetics of imitating, shall we say, unpleasant sounds. And, and uh, dear Maria, you inspired me to think of that moment in the Medea of Euripides, where Medea is so red hot angry. And she literally, may I put it this way, hisses at her soon to be ex-husband by saying, I saved you. And in Greek, esosase, esosase. She is hissing the words, I rescued you and look what you've done. Um, so I could go on and on, but um, may I do just one more quick anecdote. Um, a, a friend of mine, David Packard once did a statistical analysis of euphonic effects in the Homeric Iliad. And he was trying to see what kinds of uh, sounds that are considered the most euphonic in ancient theory, where are they clustered more than anywhere else? 
And you know what he came up with? This was actually published in the Transactions of the American Philological Association. It's where Nestor is trying to reconcile the warring, um, um, the warring um, Agamemnon and Achilles back to each other. And he uses melihi ois at the essi, he uses sweet words. And when, when the words actually come alive, they are, according to ancient theory of euphonics, the most euphonic of all sounds anywhere. And they're all bunched together in the Iliad. Well, I could go on and on, but as always, uh, dear Maria, you so engage me. And thank you again for giving me something new to think about. And then uh, we're coming to the pinnacle, but uh, this is a very difficult one because for me, Armand is, um, is shall we say, the Mount Everest of, of studies of um, ancient music. I am just so impressed, dear Armand, with how you have uh, so patiently and with such good philology, but also such musicianship uh, reconstructed uh, um, th these amazing pieces of ancient Greek music that, um, that are so hard to come by uh, and, um, and where the reconstruction is maybe um, not, how shall I say it, not accompanied by good musicianship where we're often left in the dark. Well, you bring me to light every time I, I, I listen to your reconstructions and, and, and try to wrap my mind around it. So um, I think with that in view, I, I now go to um, um, a piece of complimenting um, Armand that extends to directly to our fearless organizer, uh, my dear new friend, Bettina, whom I, I, I so respect and admire for uh, not, only, not only your intelligence and your artistry, but also your, um, your spiritual strength in, 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 uh, in your dedication to the study and the realization of ancient music. Uh, I keep thinking that when it comes to reconstructions, uh, you're a master of that, as you showed with your demonstration of how the Seculos hymn um, would have sounded like. But then when we don't have evidence for what it would have sounded like, I, I so admire the way you, um, you manage to um, give that perfect interpretation. And I like the way you and Armand, and here I loop back to Armand, use the word interpretation. You know, it's a funny thing about the English language, um, which is my second language. My first language is Hungarian. So I still have a sense of wonder about some of the things that English can do. But as I think back about um, the title of a book that my mentor, uh, Albert Lord, produced back in 1960, The Singer of Tales. I love the way uh, in the English language, um, the, the uh, verb sing and the noun singer are automatically performative. So that um, if I can put it another way, um, if you say sing or singer in English, that already um, comes with the requirement of performance. Without performance, there is no song, there is no singing. And I say that because isn't it, isn't it um, almost um, amusing that um, um, in French, for example, um, as I understand it, uh, only in the academic world can people say performance. Sure, the English language performance comes from French, but it's old French. And so what, what do people who speak French have to say now when they sit down at the piano and play a nocturne by Chopin? It's not that I will perform Chopin, I will interpret Chopin. But isn't interpretation really uh, the bravery that comes with truly bringing music to life? And to me, Bettina, you're a paragon 
of that ideal. And I, I offer you a, a garland for that, a garland of victory. And that's it for me. I think at this point, um, uh, our organizer should have the last say. It's not my right to um, insist on this, but as the oldest person here, uh, why don't I insist? Bettina, you have to have the last word. I am without words after you, Greg, the way you honored us all. And so if, uh, if nobody um, has any objections, I think we should just simply let it end here so beautifully. <laughs>